Hello and welcome again to this Red Gaming Tech video of myself and Marta. Now before I continue, I just want to say that Paul is safely back from America, but he is currently being brutalised by jet lag, so he will be back at the helm before too long. But today I have a couple of pieces to kick things off regarding the RX 590. And yes, this is the much-rumoured Polaris refresh that I've been talking about very, very recently. Of course, the rumours have been floating around for quite some time, but they have been coming fast and furious as of late. And now we have yet another one, as basically what we have here is a 3D Mark Time Spy listing for it. Now, as I've discussed previously, it is believed that the 590, or whatever it ends up being called, is going to be using 12nm, which of course will improve performance and also power efficiency as well. But by no means is it going to be a response to touring, but I don't think anyone is thinking that's what AMD are trying to do here. They're trying to get into sort of that, that middle place that Polaris has kind of been occupying for a little while now where they can definitely beat Turing on price, if nothing else. So, what do we see from this 3D Mark database entry? Well, if this information is correct, and as always, anything unofficial should be treated with a very healthy pinch of salt, it is going to be featuring a 1545MHz clock, which, for those of you paying attention at home, is 205MHz higher than that of the RX 580. Now, we do see a memory clock of 2000 megahertz, so that does heavily suggest that it is still going to be based upon a GDDR5. It is obviously suggests there's not been any change to the memory itself. However, in terms of the raw performance improvements, which obviously is the crux of the matter, I would say, we are looking at a 10% improvement roughly compared to the 480. So, in terms of the score, you can see it plainly on screen, of 5,028, and this is being run, as you can quite plainly see, with a Ryzen 7 2700, so not exactly a slouch of a CPU to back this up. Now, for those of you wondering where these results actually came from, they come from the well-known leaker Tom Apisak, whose name I still don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly, so do forgive me for that, but he is fairly well known for leaking things, especially when it comes to benchmarks. Now, of course, We've seen a bunch of rumours about the 590, you know, I think I discussed just yesterday that it might not even be called the 590, apparently it's going to be the 600 series. But this does heavily suggest that it's, it's just going to be one GPU, but perhaps there might be a 600 series to go along with it. But for the moment at least, this is pretty much lining up with everything we've heard previously, and of course we are not hearing anything to, contr to contradict, should I say, the rumours of a November release date. Now we have yet more from the world of graphics cards, but this time we actually have something regarding the RTX 2070. So what we actually have here is Hard OCP posting their review a touch before they should have done, as we have a few days before the official NDA list, but Hard OCP has published their review. Now I'm of course going to be posting a few example images from their review in this video, but by no means are they going to be all of them. I will link the full review from Hard OCP in the description below this video, so I'd highly recommend that you give it a read if you want their opinion on this particular graphics cards. And as you can see from the examples that I will be showing, and of course from Hard OCP's full review, the 2070 has a rather comfortable lead versus the GTX 1080. But of course, it is also more expensive. And of course, if you get some overclocked variants, you could obviously see that lead continue to grow. Of course, the RTX 2070 does have some other things to bring to the table, for example, like drivers might give a slight improvement in the future. Of course, there's going to be the whole ray tracing thing as well. We're going to be potentially seeing a better performance, um, the DLSS being better, should I say. But the long and short of what Haas OCP's review actually shows is pretty much in line with that leaked benchmark that we saw just the other day. We do see a lead versus the 1080, but again, we are also seeing a fair difference in price. I think the real kicker is going to be what it can bring to the table with ray tracing. Go check out our video of the GTX 1080 tie versus the 2080 tie when it comes to those 
ray tracing benchmarks that were released recently. Now I do want to stress, however, but before I go continue, actually, there there is a link to that video in the description below this video. But as I was saying, I do want to stress that that was a very simple benchmark. It doesn't show game engine load or anything like that. It is purely just looking at reflections and all that sort of stuff. So do check it out to see the advantage of the 2080 Ti versus the GTX 1080 Ti to get an idea of what we can expect with the 2070 versus the 1080, but how big of a deal it is about ray tracing for you is obviously a very personal thing. You know, even if you say that, yes, the 2070 is better at ray tracing in gaming, if you don't really care, obviously you're not really going to be all that bothered about coughing up the extra cash. So the 1080 is definitely not being put in the bin anytime soon in terms of the performance that brings to the table, but it will eventually go end of line. So if perhaps you're waiting for the RTX 2070 release just so the 1080 go down in price, that's a fairly decent shout if you ask me. Um, I think we should wait to see more reviews to get a more complete picture of what's going on here. But the crux of the matter is Touring does have more features but they are at the moment unproven and of course there is the difference in price that is the main point of contention when it comes to the RTX series with pretty much every entry in that series is very expensive even for a flagship top of the line Nvidia graphics card. So for many I think it's going to be a GTX 1080 being picked up used while they are still available on the market of course once they do go end of line they're probably going to be fairly in demand as many people are not going to want to pay the premiums that the RTX series is asking of people but this does give us a little look see as to the improvement of Turing versus Pascal. But we are going to finish things up today with a Intel piece of news for your perusal. So what we actually have here is an i5-9600K being tested at both stock and overclocked configurations. We have a Chinese stream which has shown some benchmarks and these are for CPU specific workloads. These are not gaming benchmarks, so we'll just want to get that out of the way right out of the gate. However, despite that it does still give us a nice look-see at what to expect from the i5 processors of the ninth generation which of course is going to be with us in just a few days. But what did the performance benchmarks actually have to show? Well, the first te test excuse me, that they did conduct was at stock clocks, and it was able to maintain a frequency of 4.6 GHz in single and 4.3 GHz across all cores when running intensive multi-thread workloads. However, the really interesting part of this processor, if you ask me, is its overclockability, and we do see a rather nice overclock being applied here. It was overclocked to 5.2 GHz on air cooling, which is with a voltage, should I say, of 1.5 volts. Now, that is a touch high, and we did see the temperatures going into, I would say, concerned territory, reaching about 90 degrees at full load across all four cores, which would definitely raise an eyebrow if that was my processor, I don't know about you. However, we do have some results for you with clocked, uh, sorry, base clock versus overclock, should I say. So at stock, we saw a Cinebench score of 1034, and at overclocked, we saw 1207. CPU-Z, we saw a single thread result at stock of 528.8, and a multi-thread result of 2919.1. And then overclocked, we saw a single thread result of 619 and then a multi-threaded result of 3579.7 and then we saw a x264 hd benchmark with a result at stock of 37.55 fps and then at 5.2 gigahertz we saw a result of 43.76 fps so what's the too long didn't read of all of that i hear you ask well the 9600k is about on par with in cinebench at least with the 8600k when at stock clocks but as i already said it does seem very overclockable which is obviously the most interesting part so for those of you keen on overclocking it seems like a pretty nice processor of course another thing it has over the 8600k is a better thermal interface as it is soldered, no infamous Intel toothpaste. So there are definitely some advantages to the 9600K and just obviously the ninth generation versus the previous one, especially if perhaps you're a couple of generations behind, it might be something worth considering. 
So, that is me done for this video. As I said, Paul is currently recovering from his jet lag after a very long journey back to the UK. But, before I do sign off, I obviously do want to thank you very much for watching. As always, your support is very much appreciated. But, I will also say that there are some Amazon affiliate links in the description below this video. If you're thinking of buying anything, feel free to click those links. Anything you buy through those links will give us a small commission. Obviously, you don't have to, but it is a great way to support the channel if you're thinking of buying something anyway, basically. So, regardless of all that, thanks again for watching. Bye-bye.